so welcome everyone to AI Paper Spotlights. Um, this is our monthly um, research, uh, machine learning research series, where we invite speakers from all around of uh, Berlin's machine learning ecosystem to go in depth with their research. So this is definitely, I would say, the nerdiest event that you will find in the AI campus. At least <laughs> in my opinion. And so I'm really happy to see so many people here, even on this um, gloomy uh, January evening. So my name is Alma Lindberg. Uh, I'm the host of AI Paper Spotlights. I work as a machine learning researcher here at, over at Morantix Momentum. We are um, part of Morantix, um, or rather, we're a venture. Uh, and Rontix is a uh, venture builder uh, that is also running the AI campus, this beautiful uh, location here. Um, Rontix Momentum uh, develops machine learning for uh, public and private clients, and we also do research. Um, and here today, we uh, are here to uh, listen to Pula's, hear about Pula's research, uh, Dr. Pula Schwerbel. Uh, who um, did her PhD at the Technical University of Denmark, um, incidentally in the same group that I did my PhD. Um, and Paula did her PhD on probabilistic machine learning, um, invariance learning, right, and AI ethics. And um, she finished her PhD in 2022. And after that, she joined AWS here in Berlin to work on um, AI ethics, no, responsible AI as an applied scientist. So um, I'm very happy and very much looking forward to your talk, Paula. Uh, for the online crowd, uh, we will monitor the chat for questions for the people here. Uh, we will want to preferably have your questions at the end of the talk, so I can also give a microphone to the person asking the question so everyone can follow the discussion afterwards. Okay, so let's get started. Hello, I think your mic is over there. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks, Emma. Thanks, everybody, for, for inviting me and thanks for coming, of course. Um, as I said, my name is Paula. I've been a five times here at AWS in Berlin. And I presented present this work. Um, our EMRT paper from last year, titled Geographical Erasure in Language Generation. And I want to thank uh, my co authors, Gatsa Gobrowski, Nikita Janini, Static Action Group, and then the school. I already said it, but at the end of the talk, there will be time for questions, uh, discussions. Um, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, like an understanding question, please do interrupt so, so everybody can follow the talk, but any sort of larger. Questions will will take it. Then. Yeah, so of course we're here to talk about uh, large language model research that's been amazing the last couple of months. Um, how exciting! Um, and as you know, large language models are powered by machine learning, right? So they extract patterns from training data and use those to make predictions, mm -hmm. generating language. Um, doing questions, answering, classification, translation, all sorts of tasks. This usually works really, really well. Um, here is an example. The extracted patterns are from Wikipedia, so they're probably super informative, very safe, all ways. But there are also not so useful patterns on the internet, right? So, for instance, we know that unfiltered data um, from the internet is known to be right with toxic, misogynistic, and stereotyping content. And of course, that can propagate into the model as well. And as a result, um, we see representational harms where a section of society, women, LGBTQ plus folks, or people of certain religions, are represented in poor lives or are ignored by the system altogether. Um, just a side note here, these representational hacks are usually studied along what's called protective attributes of the climate literature. So that's race, gender, occupation, sexual orientation, these kind of things. 
and then taken directly usually from US legislation. So protected attributes, the terms comes from US legislation, mm. so as well as like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And in general, one would argue that the scholarship on fair ballot is rather US centric. Mm. Just as a side note, and here we study a different and open overlooked aspect of inclusive model development, namely geographical use. The mechanism is the same, so most large scale model training efforts come from a small set of regions. Again, the models are trained on the internet. Um, some countries have more access to the internet as others, and as the model will probably see a lot more data from these countries that are dominant online, like the US, Western Europe, um, so first world, world countries. They will then represent those regions much better, um, and we will formalize what we mean by better in a bit. But first, I just wanted to say why, why this is a problem. Um, so, sort of obviously, I think there's some usability problems. So you can imagine if you train a machine learning model, a voice recognition system, say, on US data only, it's probably very biased towards a Northern American accent, um, probably can't deal very well with other sort of dialects. And then if you deploy it in one of the many other countries around the world where English is used as a second language, it might, might work significantly less well. Um, on the other hand, there are ethical problems with this. Um, again, I think intuitively it's quite clear why um, values like diversity or inclusion are violated here. But I just want to deepen this a little bit. So if we look into the linguistics and social science literature, um, there's a term for minimizing cultural and geographic identities as referred to as erasure. This is where we borrow this term, erasure. And um, it's really studied in the context of imperialism and uh, colonialism, where, I quote, people are silenced in the historical records, their contemporary presence rendered invisible, and their existence written out of the future. Now, this might sound a little esoteric to technical folks, it's being written out of the future, but I think in the context of LLMs, it's actually a really very real and very tangible danger because we train models, right? As you've seen, we train them on, on internet data, of course. Um, the model learns how to um, speak, how to generate language. But then, of course, what we do is we feed this content back onto the internet, right? There's I don't know the data, but I'm sure there's already a, a large percentage of stuff that's online that's already written in automated ways. So essentially, there's this feedback loop between generated language and then model training and then generated language um, by future models. And so uh, we run really run this danger of producing a vicious cycle of reinforcing social hierarchies. Okay, but let's make it a bit more concrete. So. In our case, our geographical evasion refers to the underpredation of certain countries compared to their English speaking populations. So, for example, when we prompt GPT 2 with I live in, it is about my times high probability to I live in Canada compared to I live in Pakistan. Fair enough, but Pakistan actually has almost four times the English-speaking population of that Canada. So that's 30 million in Canada compared to 150 million um, in Pakistan. In other words, Pakistan is drastically underpredicted compared to its population. Uh, you see the same information in the map on the top. There's predicted probabilities, the English-speaking populations um, per country, and then the expense of of under predictions so within this dash between um, the prediction probability and the English speaking population. Just, just really surprised by the fact that the Pakistan is 150 million people who speak where some other tongues English. Yeah, so we should definitely discuss a bit. Okay, I repeat the question of the problem for the audience online. So, how surprising that there's 150 million um, English speaking folks in, in Pakistan. So, this does not have to be this first language. And also, importantly, it's self reported. So, we can we can have an in depth discussion later about the data quality, but this is definitely a, a problem that we basically have no way of knowing. Um, I mean, this is data that we pulled from. 
but we have those voices, I want to say that still we don't know what, what do people understand by speak English, could be that they use it very rarely. Um, yeah, very good point. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'll formalize a bit more um, what we mean with this erasure definition. So, our metric is constructed as follows. We consider auto regressive models and open ended generation tasks. So, auto regressive just means it basically predicts the next word given a sentence or given a sequence of previous, previous words, maybe more than one token. And the key quantity of interest is this P of country given prompt. So um, in our example, the prompt was, I live in, I write C because it's sometimes called the context. And then we want to estimate the probability of Canada given I live in. And we obtain this quantity with some basic uh, rules of probability, right? And, and then in the end, we find that we simply need to compute um, I live in Canada, and then we normalize it by all, this, all our countries in our domain, so we just simply sum by the Canada and then France and so on and normalize by that to obtain this conditional theorem on the net. This is really quite easy. Um, if you use open source models, they, they often give you the logic to just add them together, sum them and normalize. So this is an easy quantity to get out of your algorithm. Okay. So what do we do next? So once we have um, this quantity computed, the uh, P of country given prompt, we compare that to a ground distribution P true. And as I said before, this P true, we simply take it to be the English speaking population of a country. And yeah, me saying simply, that has already been criticized. Um, this is certainly um, yeah, difficult to get the ground, ground truth here. Um, but it's only that given, we divide the uh, true probability divided by. Um, the model probability, and then we say a ratio occurs whenever this ratio is off by more than a threshold R. So here on the right, I plotted the P of country given context for a couple of countries. We will compare this to the own truth here in gray. And then in this example, um, I've marked all the countries that are in the erasure set at threshold R. So those countries for which the true probability is three times larger than the model probability. You guess that the size of this erasure set will vary as a function of the threshold because, um, yeah, the higher I make the threshold, the fewer countries will satisfy this criterion, so that the um, this erasure set will become smaller and smaller. And like I said before, here we'll look at the experiments we'll look at the threshold equals three. So now we know how big this image of set is. That's good. But we want to go one step further. We don't want to just um, investigate the size of the image of set. We also want to measure how big the effect is. So the final definition of our erasure matrix looks like this. Um, yeah, it's the, this ratio again. We take the log and we weigh by the ground truth probability again, sum it all up. We discussed the properties of this metric in the paper, but I just wanted to highlight two sort of aspects that are coming quite handy. So first of all, if we get the distribution right, so if we indeed find that our predicted um, probability is the true probability, then this metric evaluates to zero. This is quite important for interpretability reasons, um, because well, if, they're, if they are the same, then certainly there should be no bias. Um, and it would not be the case if we, for example, showed the cross attribute or other metrics that we use to compare probabilities. Secondly, erasure is an added component of the KL divergence. Um, yeah, the whole the KL would be um, the difference on the erasure set, and then all these other countries that are not in the erasure set um, that you arrive at the KL divergence. That's the menu as well understood theoretically. Um, and one aspect that's going to be important for us here is that it's differential. So we will later use our evasion metric as a loss function for time tuning. Um, so we need to be just differential. Okay, let's look at some experiments. So we find that erasure occurs across a wide range of models and pretty much independently 
of the model size. So here we've got a sample of like model families. The family is, is in the color, and then the size of the model is on the x-axis. Um, yeah, interesting. Ten months or so ago, we did these experiments today. So models are already a lot bigger. Um, but yeah, you get a good idea of the of the trends here. Um, on the y-axis, we plot the erasure. Um, yeah, and we see that there's not really any trend regarding the model size. They all seem to have a similar amount of erasure. I remind you, an unbiased model would have erasure zero. They all here um, around 0.6 or so on average. Um, this is something we decided to report in the paper because there's actually quite a lot of debate on the relationship between model size and model how biased the model is. This is something the community cares quite a lot about, and there there's lots of different findings. Bigger models are worse, so small, smaller models models are worse. So so that's um yeah that that's a question we've been asking ourselves with not a lot of <laughs> yeah we, we did not find a big effect on model size of bias at all. Um, secondly, we find that the degree of erasure that we observe is highly correlated with how much the country appeared in the training data. So we went and we scraped all of this um, training data that, that the, this model here, this GPT Neo X model, was trained on, and then we counted how often did all of these words appear in the training data. We then plot the true uh, distribution. In red, so again, this is how many English speaking people live there, and then we plot the P train as these frequencies in the training data, and then in blue, we plot the model probability. So again, this is P of Pakistan given I live in. And we find that, um, okay, so the um, the erased countries are again Pakistan, Nigeria, Philippines, Uganda, and where we see that the um, true probability is a lot bigger than the predicted blue. But interestingly, we see that the, the prediction for this blue really follows this distribution in the training data. So um, this hypothesis, oh, the model is biased because it reproduces biases um, in the training data, that's probably true. Now, we didn't do any um, international studies here, so, so of course we cannot argue it was because of the training data biases that we that we thought about, but we think this is this is a very likely likely reason. And you also note, and I have explained that yet, that all these um, error bars both here in the in the training data plot and also on the left, and this is essentially reformulations of the same plot. So before I search. Um, I evaluate the probability of Canada given I live in, right? But of course, there's other ways of talking about um, geography or, or, or being a resident of a country. So what we did here is we expanded this original uh, prop data set by um, getting a different pronouns. So we not only just have family in there, we also just have you live in, she lives in, et cetera. And then the same for, for these words or, or phrases of saying I live in. We also consider the problems I reside in, I come from, and so on. And so this, these error bars here, um, and these plots, they simply different reformulations um, of this plot. plot. Um, okay. Lastly, um, after measuring erasure, of course, we also wanted to mitigate it, right? So we want to kind of fix the problem that we identified before, and we find that fine-tuning is an effective way to do so. So in this experiment, we use erasure as a loss function for the NLF. So we take the weights and update them. Um, we fine-tune the model for five epochs, minimizing the loss function. And then we plot erasure on the training and the test set. So that's blue and red. Um, and we also measure perplexity to the fine tuning process in green. Perplexity is essentially a quality for how well the model, uh, how high the quality is of the generated language, because it could be that okay, we fixed the erasure problem. Now it's in Pakistan and Uganda a lot more. 
but I should not say countries at random, right? It should sort of still make sense. Like if you would not like a model that just says Uganda and Pakistan randomly, um, so it achieves a quota of saying that enough. And, and this is why we, we measure here the, the language quality in green. Um, yeah, we see that in all of these three settings, right? Then at the moment, the difference between them, uh, we actually see it works really well. The training and the test will still go down. So, after even after two epochs, there's almost no erasure left in the model. Um, generalized visually well to the test data. These are these unseen prompts that we haven't trained on. And the complexity gets a little bit worse, but um, really not a lot. So, so this works um, really quite well. And um, these three different plots, they are just, they just differ in how we split the data. So as I said before, we have this way of generating these um, 955 different prompts. And then when we split them at random, well, we split them at random. We train on 80% of the prompts and we test on 20%. Sample completely at random. And then when I write here, pronoun splits, this means we um, stratify them by the pronouns. So 80% of the pronouns are in training, 20% of them are in the test set. So all the prompts of this form, I live and I reside and I come from I one set and then they live and we live and etc. in the other. And then lastly, um, verbs just this means we, we split the data along the yeah, the verbs or the, the kind of phrases for I live in. Um, and this is arguably the hardest, I would say, because the model doesn't only need to generalize from I to you and I to she, but from live in, reside in, or live in, be a citizen of, which should be a bit harder. And that's also indeed what we see there is a bit more of a gap between training and test. Um, last but still, I would argue also here, it's, this still works really quite well. In, in conclusion for this for this paper, um, we motivated the need for large language models to be more geographically inclusive. This remains to be an overlooked aspect of inclusive model development. And specifically, we motivated and formalized a metrics for a geographical erasure. In the experiments, we found key instances of this across 10 different language models. And as hypothesized, the outcome probabilities follow quite closely the probabilities or the frequencies of country mentions in the training data. Mm, that data is likely a cause of erasure. We then examined our fine tuning and mitigation strategy and find it to um, be effective in alleviating this erasure bias. Um, yeah, for details, please do read the paper. And the code is also open source. You can find it here at the link. Um, Maybe you want to run a similar analysis for the kind of models that you are using day to day. Drop me an email if that's true, if you have to help. Um, and now to close, I just wanted to give a bit of a broader, broader view on the response to the I for LLMs. So, of course, geographical erasure is only one small aspect of fair and responsible model development. Um, I'd like to highlight this library that our team has developed that helps you evaluate LLMs through a much wider range of response to AI dimensions. It's called FMB Bell, Foundation Model Evaluation Suite. You can also find it on GitHub. And I'll just walk you quickly through, through what it does. So it allows you to evaluate models in a range of common tasks. Write them here on the left, open ended generation. That's just what you think of it, right? We, we prompt the the model it open ended the um, finishes the prompt summarization. You might have a long long document and you want to just um yeah summarize it get the most important bits. QA stands for question answering. You answer you ask them all the questions you wanted to answer correctly either using its own world knowledge or maybe with um, some sort of references. So it's allowed to to use references to answer your question. Um, and then lastly, classification. So this is, we often see this used by our customers. They want to do say sentiment analysis on reviews. They want to know whether people like, like products or not. Um, they want to, yeah, um, perform other sort of classifications as what kind of test, uh, text is this. Um, 
Now for this task, we have implemented a range of evaluations, so different kind of perspectives along which you can evaluate the model, that's task accuracy, how well does it work, right? Um, so that semantic robustness, this means if I change the input a little bit, does the output remain the same? Is it stable in that sense? Um, factual knowledge is, um, yeah, another evaluation for how, how much well knowledge that does the model have. Um, kind of respond correctly to questions you might ask it. Um, so the third one from stereotyping, that's a pretty classic one from, from the data literature as well. It's like, um, that the model encodes biases and stereotypes. The way we measure it is we present the model with two sentences, one that would be considered more stereotypical. For example, he is a doctor, one is less stereotypical, say she is a doctor, and then if your model assigns a lot higher probability to he is a doctor, you would say, okay, the model has biases and all of the gender um, attributes. Lastly, toxicity. Um, that's simply measuring how often your model uses um, unsafe language, vulgar language, um, yeah, or, or it just uh, speaks in, in toxic ways that you would want to um, expose your customers to. Um, again, this is an open source library. You can just download it, try it out locally. Um, or uh, this is quite important for our customers. You can use it easily in your MLOps pipeline on AWS infrastructure. So it's already integrated with state maker models, bedrock models, Java models, and you basically don't need to write your own code, but you can do UI or sort of yeah, integrating it. Um, and I just want to reiterate that this um, endeavor of responsible AI, we feel very much benefits from diverse perspectives. So this library is designed around like sensibility. Um, we make aim to make it easy for the community, that's you, <laughs> to bring in additional evaluations. So we very much appreciate if you try it out, interact with it, leave a sound GitHub, clone it, play around with it, and maybe even add your own evaluation if that's something you're, you're working on. Um, we review pull requests ongoingly and we're super eager to, to collaborate on that. Um, cool, yeah, and with that, uh, thanks again. And I said all these resources here that came up during the talk. Um, and now we have, I think, about 20 minutes for discussion questions. Uh -huh. Okay, who will answer questions here? So, thank you. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm an AI ethics researcher at Charité. Um, really interesting work, and I'm uh, supposed to see what Amazon is doing in terms of responsible AI. Um, I'm just wondering, um, oh my god, it's cool. my questions. Uh, hold on, it'll come back. Just one second. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, does this generalize? Like, you fine tune the model. Or I live in and like mm -hmm. synonyms for it, but what about I worked in or I exactly I played football in? Totally, really good question, right? So we we ask ourselves the same question, and then the best we can sort of come up with is this, like you already said, this kind of um, rephrasing this I live in prompt, right? We did the the prize using another LLM, so we just automatically. Um, and you are asking, you know, okay, and we know how well does it generalize across different phrasings of I live in. Yeah. We know it generalizes reasonably well, right? This was a spot. Now, what you're saying, what about I use other prompts that don't have to do with I live in, but are sort of in family? Like, for example, if you say I work in, it's almost like I would need to change the ground truth as well, right? Because now I want to use the ground truth probably all the people that work in those countries or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of things you can assume that's related to, like wherever you live, you probably also work there. Right. But the question I'm wondering is, the fine tuning works for this, mm -hmm. but if it actually is a 
going to work, then you you have to do this for all the verbs. I mean, that's a lot of work. So, so, so yeah, that's why I went, like, did you test it on how does it perform them I, on I work? Well, the question it, is whether it actually goes deep enough to, oh, sorry. The question is whether it actually goes deep enough to, uh, to rectify the model's assumptions of the worldview. So when you say, is an English speaking app, um, it would Pakistan be a good market for English speaking app? And it has nothing to do with phrases and splits that you fine tune it on, but it, it has very much to do with the underlying assumptions of the world. Did you verify whether this would also then be effective? That's essentially the question, right? It's, I'm just, there's a lot of fine tuning you have to do to fix the whole model. It, yeah, this exactly. only narrowly works for I live in, but nothing related to it. So I'm just like, uh, maybe it works a little bit for our working, and it's like, is there like it would be interesting to like see a comparison? Maybe it works like, a little bit for our working, but not a lot or something. But then it would still improve the overall model if you only do this. That's my question. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I, I, um, at the risk of repeating myself, so we've, we've checked this. You are asking about the bus, so here in the train, I have maybe I live in, I reside in. But I, it has never seen I am a citizen of, I grew up in, I hail from. So in that sense, we've already checked this generalization of Thomas, if that makes sense. But can I just get yeah, yeah, yeah. it? Well, that's oh. a synonym. Exactly. You haven't tested for related, but not a synonym. That's what I was asking for. But exactly. I mean, it's language, right? So these things are a little fuzzy. Um, when I was talking a citizen, like, uh, a synonym like a citizen is not technically a synonym either for a living, but it would, it would definitely be interesting to test. I agree what happens if you go more and more away from, from synonyms. As I said in the beginning, I think at some point you would also want to change the, um, the ground truth. Because, for example, say if I say, oh, grown is the capital one. X then I don't want the same distribution then I want like a dance on this right because I want to actually get the truth out. So so that was the, the subtlety I mentioned earlier, but I absolutely agree that would be really interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you for a very efficient presentation. Um you mentioned a possible remedy in fine tuning. I was wondering if you considered um or if it's possible to remedy it with just direct prompting and be like, I don't know, you are a person who loves geography and loves traveling and you don't want to write it. Like, would that change the answers? Excellent question. This is actually the work we're doing with Alex and the back. My colleagues. <laughs> we're trying to we think it's going to work. Um, yeah, okay. I, my discussion is that it will work. Yes. I mean, try to Uh, so my question is on the um, it's on the um, the part of what happens actually after the fine tuning. So say so you find you fine tune your model, how does it impact like other tasks that, that the model was um let's say instruction tuned on? So does it impact like summarization or any other of these, these tasks? Yeah, really good question as well, right? So what we test here is just really the ease we ask ourselves this question, but the only thing we test is perplexity, which is Basically, I have for open ended quality. Like, is it quality language or is it gibberish? We have not tested how does it would impact any other sort of downstream tasks. Mm. My assumption would be that unless the downstream task is something that is quite specific to geographies, it wouldn't change much, right? Because as we've had before, oh, it's a little bit to geographies, like probably in this last region of the of the input space where nothing will happen. So I would be optimistic that I also won't destroy anything in these other spaces that or other parts of the input space that have nothing to do with geographies, but it would be also worth a worth a kind of I don't know because I mean I think there's like this um it's a bit anecdotal, right? But I think it was like at some point it was like a new release of like chat GPT4 and people were saying are we actually losing it? It's actually doing worse than before. And um, I mean, the rumor was a bit of okay, they, um, they did like some additional work on like more, more making the model safer, but this then had a cost in terms of like the, the actual performance on, on uh, other tasks. So I don't know, I think it's probably something to, to the things we wanted to. I mean, what I would really say here as 
so I'm not defending my paper, but as a, as a researcher, right, as a scientist, what I think it's really interesting here is you essentially ask them to understand like what's going on in this model, right? The child will wait a little bit here, like what happened, you said this already, what happens to the knowledge representation? So so I think the tool of choice here is some sort of explainability tool, and you would be quite trying to get a mechanistic understanding of what the model does. And because otherwise you can never go beyond these like punctual checks, right? I mean, I can find them, I can evaluate performance on like a hundred QA benchmarks, I can report to back a number, but then uh Captain Morgan is going to say, yeah, but what about generalization? So I think unless you have like a it, it, it seems to me that the interesting thing would be to really get this kind of mechanistic understanding of what happens in the model, how does this part of the base state relate to this other space, like what's what's going on under the hood. I think that would be the tool to answer these kind of questions for real. Also big big research in general, of course. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, this is maybe a very basic question. Um, you calculate the probability of um, like the all of the outputs per model, and also the you calculate the distribution of like Pakistan or whatever in the training um, data. How did you do that, or like did you have access to the entire training data, or? Yeah, so we we only it's not a basic question, it's a good question. We we did this only for this model. Um, here, this um, GPT Neo X model, with, with, which has a great advantage, it's an open source model. So the authors they actually um, stated exactly what data sets they use. Sometimes, yeah, they made it available all the um, all the details. It's this Eloy the AI group that did it. And so we really were, and, and we work at AWS, right? So we have lots of computers, so we were really able to. Go to all of the data sets. If they say, oh, we tra train 10 epochs of the data sets, we will weigh that data set up 10 times. Um, so we really actually went through all the data sets and it was trained on and counted the, the frequencies. I think what you're hinting to for, uh, I don't know, chat to PT4 or these like so any closed source model, we, we wouldn't be able to do it. And even for open source model, at some point, if, if the data set is big enough, it probably becomes unreasonable to, to go through it and count these words, right? But if for this experiment, that's exactly what we did there. Maybe you said that this but is there any uh, what was the opposite of correlation? This correlation no. I don't know. Yes, I, I would assume that there's a correlate a direct correlation between the frequencies of the training data and the results of the model. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, okay, so that's and yeah. that's here. So know, so yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't report to correlation, right? But I mean, these numbers are, yeah, correlated, very close, and then, um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So just to make sure. Yeah. Uh, I have a very basic question as well. Uh, I believe we could uh, think of this work in a way that it could work for other types of erasures, like gender erasure, other things. But then I imagine the solution would be also fine tuning for each. And then for one model to correct for all, we'll fine tune for all the erasures. Um, but what do you think would that work? I, I think it would work. Um, I think it would be a little tedious that came up earlier, right? So we want to now do this for all domains. Um, but I do think it would work in principle, right? And, and I think. It, about this, the tedium of doing it for all domains, it's also not every application that requires the model to do everything perfectly. So maybe you can, I'm not saying it's kind of CLA at all, but, but I do think you might, there might be domains where you know, okay, here for this particular use case, it's just really important that the gender bias is removed or the geographical bias is removed. Or um, we've seen a lot of examples from from hiring, right? And there we know already from, from past research that there's this big bias between correlating certain genders with certain occupations. And this is something you could relatively easily fix, it would be possible to get ground truth. And, and I think that we think of applications where this kind of punctual um, improvement would be would be valuable. But certainly to do it for all possible biases and all possible scenarios, that would be that would be it. Say the least. Yeah. Yeah, that actually ties beautifully in with, sorry, our, our 
we have to some kind of computer question session. Um, but there, there's a question from the chat that kind of relates to this also. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, is uh, basically like, is it is it feasible to actually like perfectly balance on the whole set, or would you imagine that you had kind of um, you you had sort of local models like this this model is fine tuned for Jamaican English. This is an Australian English. And then also, is this even computationally feasible, uh, given, of course, the fine tuning, if you end to end fine tune an LLM, that's, of course, AWS has, research, has resources for that, but maybe not everyone. Um, and I, I would also maybe combine with a little question for me, which is, um, would, would it be feasible to maybe do this as sort of in an adapter fine tuning approach where you could kind of clip on an adapter for for each of your uh, dimensions that you would want to balance out? Yes, there was a couple of questions and then I try to. Okay, I'll do the last one first. So um, I've seen, um, I think this adapter here is great. I've seen this. Um, idea of rate based arithmetic where you kind of fine tune for example for toxicity and then you kind of identify the direction in the way space where if you go that way the model will become more toxic and then you simply just go in the other way like it's so simple it shouldn't almost work so i think that's that could work <laughs> yes um about open you really have a foundation model that has all these like cultural kind of subtleties baked in and, and work for everybody at the same time. I think, I don't know, I think a lot of researchers in the space have like burnt their hands and think, oh, we cannot do this. And then all these, done, like, all these super amazing things. I'm not going to say we can't do it. I think we know we can't do it. But I also think that we might um, see a more sort of localized approach, right, where different, maybe different companies have their own smaller models or different, yeah, maybe different parts of the of the planet have some of that smaller models that they can use. So maybe we'll go away again from this like huge foundation model approach because, well, one reason is because environmental impacts, right? Like, do you always need to run your like 100 billion parameter model if you can get away with something much smaller? Um, that's probably desirable for us as environmental sectors as well. So, so do I think it's possible? Maybe. Um, I mean, we can barely agree as humans on global ethical standards. So, like, surely it would not be easy, right? But possible, maybe. But would it be the practical thing to do? I'm, I don't, I'm not sure. I think some globalization is, is probably not, not bad. Yeah. All right. Well, so thank you for that also forward looking outlook into the future of LLMs. Um, thank you so much again for your talk, Paula. And we will hang around here for a bit longer to have some drinks and snacks and chat, network. Maybe Paula will also stick around for a little bit if we're lucky. Then you can ambush her with more questions um, in, a, in a gentle way, please. Um, and thank you very much to the online crowd as well. Uh, our next um, AI Paper Spotlights event will be in a month. Also, um, on the first Tuesday of February, and where all of Marantic's Momentum's research team will do a recap of the coolest papers that we read from Europe's. So, uh, please come back for that, and thank you so much for joining today. Also, thank you to the online crowd. Um, yeah, thank you.